in. Well, well yeah, I had, digging up stuff on Abel and then Alan on Enoch, that wasn't easy, but Abraham's the opposite problem. There's too much. <laughs> I mean, Abraham is mentioned over 200 times, 250 times in the Bible by name. New Testament, 75. And I've got all those scriptures on slides. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but, but he is mentioned a lot. And there's good reason for that. He's, he's been called the father of our faith. And actually the word Abram, which was his original name, means father or mighty father, high, exalted father. Abraham, with the H-A added in the middle, means father of multitudes or father of nations. So his name is very significant. His name is very significant because that was his calling uh, to be the father of nations. Um, this is the verse in Hebrew, the verses in Hebrew as we're looking at today. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So a lot of those verses I mentioned mention Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the big three of the Old Testament, in God establishing his, his nation. Um, so we first hear about Abraham in Genesis, actually a little bit before that, um, but Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is where he receives the call. So the Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Didn't name it. I'll show it to you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him. Um, there's actually a, mention, a little bit of a mention of Abraham earlier in uh, Genesis. But there, here's a, this, is just, this isn't really relevant to the point, but I just thought this is interesting. In Abraham's descendants, in his ancestry, uh, there's a guy named Eber, and then in 11.8 there's a guy named Ru, so you put Eberu, sounds like Hebrew, right? And that actually is where the name Hebrew came from, the term for the Semites, which are Shem's line, the Semitic peoples, and the Hebrews are specifically Eber's and Ru's descendants. And there's the name of uh, Abraham. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It's no charge on that one. So <laughs> free little piece of trivia for the next uh, Jeopardy or whatever. Um, so, but earlier, um, the Abram was, Abram was from Ur originally. Ur is in Babylon, present day Iran. Uh, interesting, it came from Iran, uh, which today is Iran. So they, uh, Terah, who's Abraham's father, took took his family, and it says in Genesis 11 that they were about they were on their way to the land of Canaan. So they actually had it in mind to go that direction, uh, but they stopped in Haran, and and Terah then Abraham's father died there. So that's where Abraham was living when he got this call, apparently. Uh, so then God says go, and he went. So he was called to this new land. Of course, it ends up being Canaan. And it's possible that, you know, God says later, I called you from Ur to go to the land I promised. So anyway, God got him there somehow. Um, but imagine what, what that was like to leave his family. He said he left his relatives. He took his nephew Lot with him, wife Sarah. Uh, but imagine what that was like just to say, in that time, Go. Now, in our, in our married life, we've moved maybe three or four times, right? I think one time God really said go, but I, the other times I'm not really sure. But, you know, moving in our day is not that hard. I mean, we moved, you know, we've always lived in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan. So we went out, but we had movers and trucks and stuff like that. We had a destination. We knew exactly where we were going. We had a place to live all lined up. So in some ways, going uh, today is not that big a deal. In the, in, when you compare it to Abram, Abraham having didn't even really know for sure where he was going and had camels and took months and dangers and all kinds of hardships, didn't have a house, just had tents. So, so it's a whole different story. Not A lot of times God sends people, though, in more radical ways than just moving around the country. Uh, there's this lady named Jackie Pollinger. I don't know if anybody's heard of her. She was a British lady. 
Uh, she wanted to be a missionary. She just went to, went to Hong Kong, or, you know, just went there. I don't know why, but God was telling me to go there. She went with no support. Nobody was supporting her, giving her no mission agency. She just went. And she just proceeded to start ministering to the poorest of the poor. She taught them. She fed them. She somehow got the resources to do this. And that was really a God thing. It was kind of a modern Abraham story. Uh, now, in contrast, I had a kid at Valpo University years ago. Uh, he was just kind of a, he came to one of our meetings we had on campus. We used to have campus ministry kind of going on. So we came and just got really turned on to the Lord. And he heard about this school named Oral Roberts University. And he, I remember he had a lot of his stuff stored in my garage for a while. Um, Derek, hi. And so due to a while, Derek just, Derek moved a long way down to North Carolina, da, da, da. But anyway, so this kid named Brian, he wanted to go to Earl Roberts. So he just said, I think God's calling me to go there. So he went. And, and I was the financial aid director at the time, and he was, he was worried about money. So he showed up at the financial aid director's door at ORU and said, God called me to be here. <laughs> and the guy, I talked to this guy on the phone, that's why I knew this. And so his, his answer was, well, don't you think he would have told me to so I could have gotten ready for you to... <laughs> to come to this place. So every time, you know, God doesn't call people to go everywhere, but in Abraham's case, he called them. And it was a very significant place. God's choice of the land that he called them to, he, that's where he would establish his people and set them apart as a nation. And that would, would be where the Messiah would come from. So it was a hugely significant move. If Abraham didn't, hadn't gone there, God would have found another way to do it, but he used Abraham. So, three things. It's going to be a three-point message. I was telling Doris earlier. It won't be too complicated, though. I promise. I hope not, anyway. The first thing is he, he heard God's voice. You know, we always read, okay, well, God told Abraham. Well, uh, sometimes we don't listen when God tells us stuff, right? Abraham was in a place where he heard God's voice. We'll expand more on these points as we go. He believed God's promise. God said, I'm going to do this for you. He believed him. Later on, it'll say a, a key verse in Hebrews, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he obeyed. Three things. He heard, he believed, and he acted. He obeyed. So those are three really important things for us as believers as we follow our path that God has brought about for us. And God working through Abram's hearing and believing and obeying uh, accomplished his purposes in ways that Abram couldn't even have imagined. I mean, he heard it, but I, I just don't think he really realized the whole scope. But, but throughout his life, he, Abram lived this. He, um, even to the point where he sacrificed his son Isaac, that's a, some verses that somebody else might talk about later, but I can't resist mentioning it. I mean, the ultimate test where he had to sacrifice his son and he, he heard God, he, he believed, and he obeyed. And Hebrews tells us later that he, he, he reasoned that God could even raise Isaac from the dead. So and then he told Isaac, you know, God will provide the sacrifice for my son. So the faith that Abraham had was just awesome as he believed God and um, acted on it. Whoops. So let's talk a little bit about hearing God's voice. We hear many voices in our day, don't we? Our flesh speaks to, I'm hungry. <laughs> Got to get that food. We hear the voice of the enemy, planting little doubts and thoughts in our head. Um, you know, we have the voices of the world, voices of our, our people that talk, tell us things that may not be true or that may be something that doesn't really speak to who we are. We just saw this movie last night, uh, Overcomer. That's the latest Kendrick Brothers movie. Really good movie, but it's all about identity. And at one point, you know, people are asked, well, who really are you? Am I a basketball? You know, we, we think of things like, well, I work here, I work there, I'm a basketball coach, whatever. But who we really are sometimes gets lost in all the clutter of the voices. That, that we're, son, we're children of God, we're forgiven and we're redeemed. We lose that sometimes in all the voices of the world. So how do you discern all these things? Well, the first thing, whoops, that's not, well, we'll get to that. First thing is know the word of God because God's spoken to us through this huge, long, many books book. Uh, as far as we know, Abraham didn't have anything in writing then. 
as far as we know about the scriptures, Moses actually wrote them all from oral traditions. Abraham probably had oral, oral traditions to draw on. But there wasn't any written word for him that we know of. But he was living the word, right? He was inventing the word. It, it, the word, he was it. Um, I don't know how God spoke to Abraham at the time. Um, audible voice, you know, whatever. But 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 he spoke and, and he heard. So God, uh, Abraham, um, heard God's voice somehow. But today for us, the, the, the scripture is the primary source for us. Um, but the scriptures that are a primary source also say things like Jesus saying, my sheep hear my voice. And in, in Acts, the Holy Spirit falls and, and, and Peter quotes Joel saying, uh, young men will, dream, will see visions. Old men like me, I only get to dream now. Uh, <laughs> young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. And so God speaks in so many ways today apart from the word. The only caution is if you, if you hear something you think is God, does it line up here? That's, that's the first test. Does it line up with the word? Does it really reflect God's character as he revealed it? Um, there's a really great little story or book actually written a few years ago called uh, Dreams and Visions. And it's written by a guy who does ministry to Muslim countries. And he, he gives one, uh, many examples of people who see Jesus in visions and dreams and come to know him because of that. And there's one episode in the book where God speaks to somebody telling him, go to this place in the market. And um, then somebody else was told something similar. And they meet and they talk to each other and they both had dreams and visions of Jesus. So God says a lot of stuff today that's beyond what he's actually written here. But it's called the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we need to listen to the Spirit, be guided by the Spirit, um, and be led by the Spirit. So, friendship, friend of God. This is what I love about Abraham. I, you know what I know about in the Bible that is actually called God's friend. Isn't that cool? He's a friend of God. Let me see where they are. Where did I put my clicker here? So, Second Chronicles says, Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and who gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Friend of God. I love that. Isaiah 41 8, you Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. What do you think it means to be a friend of God? I think what we see with Abraham's life is that he was able to really just pour out his heart to God, have really honest conversations with him. Like any friendship, it kind of cuts both ways, right? I mean, if people are friends, you, you can pour out stuff to them. They can pour out stuff to you. Um, and Abraham had times when he was, you know, had to have some conversations with God. Um, several times in Genesis, it mentions that he called on the name of the Lord. He built altars and he called on the name of the Lord. So he pursued God. He went after God. And sometimes he had concerns. I mean, God made these promises, but Abraham couldn't see them happening. Nothing was happening. You're, you're going to be the father of multitudes. And Abraham said, I'm not even a father at all yet. I don't even have a child. But he complained to God. He, he mentioned the concerns. He kind of implied, oh, God, you're a little slow in keeping this promise. Are you sure you're going to do this? Uh, he had doubts along the way. Uh, in fact, Genesis 15, 2, he's talking about uh, God's given this promise again. And they said, well, Lord, I'm childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. You know, what's going on here? Uh, and then later on, um, he um, had the Ishmael episode where he goes into Hagar and has, has her. Um, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you, he says. If only. But he was really free to complain to God and to express his frustration. So if you have your Bibles or devices handy, go to Exodus, I'm sorry, Genesis. I just happened to turn to Exodus. Genesis 18 for a minute. Because this, to me, is just a really good example of how Abraham's relationship with God was and God's relationship to Abraham. Two-way street, remember? This is what the, where the three guests come and they prophesy about Sarah having, having the child. But what I want to focus on, because somebody else has Sarah later in the series, I don't want to steal their thunder. But starting with verse 16, the men got up, looked over Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to see them off. 
That's in verse 16. Then the Lord said, should I hide what I am about to do from Abraham? So God is actually appearing in the flesh as one of these three guys, is what we kind of read from this. And he's wondering, well, sh which, should I hide this from him or should I tell him? And he decides to tell him. I just find that really fascinating that the God of the universe, the creator, is wondering, what, how am I going to break this to my friend Abraham? Yeah. What, what am I going to, should I share this with him? And then he goes on to say, Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation and lead all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him that he will command his children. He's kind of talking to himself or the other two guys right now. Um, to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised him. So then the Lord decided, I'm going to tell Abraham. Okay, Abraham, I'm going to um, go down and see um, and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah in, in essence. Or at least their sin is really serious. What should I do about it? I'm going to go down and, and see if um, we, we have to destroy these folk. Uh, so then the men went and turned towards Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So the other two left and Abraham remained with his friend, with the Lord. And then he starts questioning God. Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away? You could not possibly do such a thing. To kill the righteous with the wicked. Treating the righteous and the wicked alike. You could not possibly do that. Why won't the judge of the whole earth do what is just? Can you imagine talking like even to your boss at work that way? You can't do that. Why would you do a bad thing like that? You might not have a job very long. But here's Abraham talking to the God of the universe, talking like this. Isn't that amazing? To me it was, but I just really thought about it. And I think God, my theory anyway, doesn't say that here, but I think one of the reasons God revealed this to Abraham was he wanted to, I think he really wanted his opinion, but he wanted Jake to arouse Abraham's compassion you know, for people. And he, he really found that in Abraham's heart. In some ways it's a test, like the, the test of sacrificing Isaac. It's a test of what's Abraham going to do about this you know, if I tell him this. So anyway, then he starts bargaining with him, of course. He gets to 50 down to 10, finally. I think God knew all along that there, weren't any, there wasn't anybody righteous that still fought in his family, but he just wanted Abraham to have that, that dialogue, and he wanted his opinions. God wants our opinions sometimes. You know, it's the same thing with us, really. I mean, I, I think being a friend of God, a couple things. I mean, we, we really need to be free to express whatever we feel. Read the Psalms sometimes. Uh, some of the psalmists, including David, are just, you know, why God, why the wicked do, you know, there's all kinds of complaining and moaning and groaning. Um, but God, like, he wants to hear from his friends. He wants their opinions. You know, Job is a great example. You know, he, he poured out his heart to God and said, why, why, why? And God told him why, eventually. Didn't tell him why, but he at least answered him. So David and others in the Psalms express their deepest thoughts, their doubts, their hurts, their pain to God. But then the second step is we've got to learn to listen. Okay, what's he going to say to me? You know, Habakkuk is one of the little prophets, but he says, you know, he complains. They say, I'm just going to wait and hear what God says to me. That, that's the attitude that we need to have. Is It's a friendship, a relationship goes both ways. Okay, let's see what we have next. James also mentions this. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But James also calls him God's friend. Okay, second point, he believed. He believed God's promise. And 15.6 is a key verse, and that gets quoted a lot. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Because I know how we are righteous, right? We believe what? What do we believe? That God sent his son, Jesus, who died, rose again, and he forgives us all of our sins and makes us his child, and we believe that we are righteous. John says, whoever believes in me, and John 3, 16, whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. So we believe. Abraham believed.
So Paul quotes this a lot. In fact, he, he develops a whole chapter on it, Romans 4. Um, and in Galatians 3, 6, he quotes it. And then uh, James also quotes it, which we'll get to later. Um, anyway, Abraham believed what he said, and it was credited with righteousness to him. Um, however, if you read Hebrews, in, in two sections on Abraham, actually, uh, you don't see any, any doubts or weaknesses there. You just see he's a man of faith. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, he did that. But if you read all the heroes of the faith there, they all, I mean, even Samson's mentioned briefly. I mean, he had his faults, uh, of course, but as we all do. But Hebrews really seems to, to exalt all these people without really even mentioning their faults and their doubts and their shortcomings. And actually, Romans 4 is another passage, if you can look there for a minute. Um, Actually, I might even have that printed here. Yeah, Romans 4 is, is a, another good example of that about Abraham. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our father in God's sight, in whom Abraham believed. The God who gives life to the dead, remember Abraham believed Isaac would be raised from the dead, and calls things into existence that do not exist. He believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations according to what had been spoken. So will your descendants be, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body to be already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and also the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to do. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. Not only for him, but for us. So when I read that and when I read Hebrews, when I read the history of Abraham, somehow it doesn't quite add up, does it to you? I mean, he had his doubts. He, he, he never wavered in his unbelief. Why can't Ishmael, <laughs> da, 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 Eliezer is going to be my heir. You know, he, he, he complained. He doubted sometimes, right? Is that how you read it? And yet when Paul and other, and the authors of the Hebrews talk about him, it's like the faith, the faith, the faith. He didn't waver. Um, you know, actually, I think he gets a little bit of a bad rap on Ishmael and Hagar episode because you know, some of you know this story. He, it wasn't happening, so then Sarah said, "Well, here's my servant Hagar. You know, have a child by her." But you know that before that happened, God had made a promise to him again in 15:4, "One who comes from your own body will be your heir." Didn't even mention Sarah's body. So in Abraham's mind, he thought, "Well, this may be God's way of answering this prayer. I'll do Hagar." You know, this might, I think that that might be what he thought because all God said is, you're going to have a son. didn't say by who at that time. Now, later he would say by Sarah. But um, Then he had the, the episode of Abimelech or in the Pharaoh in Egypt. Where he said, well, she's my sister. Say you're my sister. So he deceived uh, Abimelech and the Pharaoh about who Sarah really was. But as he pointed out to Abimelech, she really is my sister because <laughs> he was like a half-sister, I guess. So anyway, so Abraham had his moments of weakness, right? But Hebrews 11 doesn't mention it. Uh, and I think what that tells me is that God's more concerned about our faith than our mistakes. He's more concerned about what we will be than what we've been. He has a plan for us to be as credited to us as righteousness when we believe. That means that God overlooks all these other things. It sure seems to me that's what he did in, at, to Abraham. He wasn't perfect. You know, there's a, remember Gideon? He was, uh, the Israelites were being, in the time of the judge, was being persecuted by Midianites. So Gideon was hiding in the wine press, d doing his grapes, and he was, he was hiding out. He was afraid. He was dominated by fear of the Midianites. And this angel appears to him and says, Mighty warrior. And Gideon's probably going, well, who's he talking to here? Um, but see, God saw Gideon for what he would be, not for what he was. What he, what God, the plans God had for him, not what he had been. Is that true for you, maybe? Things don't look good right now? Randy's nodding his head. A lot of people are probably nodding their heads. But when we believe what God says, what God spoke, 
That's, there's a lot of power in that for our future and for our present. How many of, how many of us were perfect before we got saved? Nobody. All right. Okay. Makes my point. Pardon? So, and I guess another thing I might say is that uh, do, um, having doubts or talking to God about them isn't really unbelief. Because Abraham has doubts, he talked to God about them, and he commended for his faith that he believed God. So I guess I'd encourage you, if you have doubts about things and you talk to God about it, that doesn't mean you don't have faith. It just means you got to get some, you know, you need more strengthening. Uh, talks about Abraham being strengthening in his faith in Romans here. See that? Um, he did not waver, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. So he doubted, but he didn't waver because he immediately brought those doubts to God. He got strengthened to the next step. Okay. Third thing, he obeyed God's command. He heard, he believed, and he obeyed. Three simple steps. He, did, he obeyed even though he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know the process, how this would happen, the challenges and tests he would have along the way. Uh, you know, the supreme test being you know, the, the son that God finally did give him from him and Sarah. He asked him to sacrifice him. I mean, you know, I can't imagine the kind of test that God put Abraham through. But he often gives us tests too, right? He, he tells us maybe to do something. And I mean, when he told Adam to go, I mean, to a place, I'll show you. I'm not going to tell you where yet, but I'll show it to you. And remember the, in, in the book of Acts, Philip the Ethiopian, and the Ethiopian, God said to Philip, the Holy Spirit said, go to this road. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Just go. So he went to the road. Then he said, look over there. And he looked over and there's this chariot. He said, go to that chariot. So it's like, Philip had no clue what he was supposed to do, but he went. He just went. Isn't that like, like that with us too, that obedience can be one little step, but we don't know what the outcome is going to be. I mean, it could be bad. For all, I mean, in the, fle in the flesh, in a sense. I, I've told this story before, but there's a guy named Telemachus. He was a monk, 300s AD or something. So God just told him, go to Rome. You heard this story before? He was a real guy. So he went to Rome, and he didn't know what he was going to do there, but he saw these crowds, and um, they were going to the Colosseum for these gladiatorial games. He just kind of followed the crowd. He went in there. He was horrified to see these gladiators fighting each other. You know, he, did, he was just horrified at that. So I don't think he needed God to tell him this, although God might have, but he, went, he got down actually into the arena. He kept saying, in the name of Christ, stop. In the name of Christ, stop. And they were, first people thought he was part of the act, part of the show, so they were laughing at him. Finally, he started to try to break up a couple fight, you know, one of the gladiators or two of them. And one of them just said, okay, just ran him through, killed him right there. And then the, the way the story goes is that people started to leave without saying a word. And the story is that that was the last time anyone was killed in a gladiatorial contest in Rome. And, and then it was banned and public you know, outcry about it. God just said, go to Rome. That's all. And he had no idea what was going to happen, but his life was sacrificed to save many, many other lives. Abraham was told to go. He didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but things did. Philip didn't know, but he got to the chariot, heard the guy reading scripture, and said, oh, yeah, this is why God sent me here. Sometimes you've got to take it one step at a time. And that's what Abraham did. Okay. Now it's interesting, when Paul talks about that verse, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, Paul uses it in the sense that, you know, it's not about works, it's not about our deep works, it's all about faith. Abraham believed God. Now James has another little take on it here. Well, look at what he says. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete, and a scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, 
It was today too, but it was righteous faith. And he was called, called God's friend. So Abraham uses that verse to say it's all about faith, not works. James says, appears to say, well, it's about works. So how do you how do you reconcile those? You know, if we read James in its entirety, we'll see that James is always talking about um, work, you know, real faith works. Right? Faith without works is dead. And so what James is saying is that our faith isn't any good or maybe isn't really even faith unless the obedience follows. It's hear, believe, obey. It's a package, package deal. Can't have one without the other or shouldn't anyway. In fact, James earlier in the chapter, a few verses earlier says, you know, so you, you believe God is one? Fine, the devil believes that too. The devil believes all this stuff. So believing it isn't enough. It has to turn into action. Um, and even oh, another way to put it is James says our faith, faith, his faith was made complete. See, believing without acting is incomplete faith. It's not really complete. Now, the Bible in several places almost uses the words believe and obey interchangeably. Romans 16, not all have obeyed the gospel. I thought it was believe the gospel. Well, another way to say it, obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, who has believed our message. Obedience and belief, almost like the same thing. Thessalonians 1, those who don't know God and those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Sounds pretty clear, yeah. If we believe, we obey. Whoop, that's it. I don't have more slides, but I got a couple other things to say in the video I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, three things I keep harping on this you, know, you hear, you believe, and you obey. And, and, you know, Abraham was called to go. And aren't we all called to go, in a sense? Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples. So Dave, can you run that video real quick? This is a video by, I think his name is J.D. Greer, but it's just this whole idea of go. And our series is As We Go, right? Got it? One day, by God's grace, I'm going to find Ishmael. But I know that there are, listen to me, individuals just like him all over the world who are somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody's mother, somebody's father. And they are as precious in God's sight as you are in your parents' sight. They know what it's like to be lonely. They know what it's like to be afraid. They have the same wants, needs, hurts, and desires that you have because they're made in the image of God just like you are. And to go to hell for them is every bit the tragedy that it is for you and me. So could we please quit talking about 2.2 billion people like it's a stat around the world and start to understand it for what it really is, and that is individuals made in the image of God who are as valuable to God as you are. And I do not understand the way that looks at life that says, I'm just not that concerned with what's going on around the world. I don't understand the posture that says to God, God, I am asking you what your will is. We talk about finding God's will. It's not lost. The Lord is not willing, 2 Peter 3, 9, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I, I, I see it a lot like, um, you know, if you, were, if you were walking down, you know, somewhere downtown and there was a railroad track and there was a, a, a young child that was on the railroad tracks and the child was crippled and couldn't get off and there was a train coming. You don't stop and get down on your knees and ask God what his will is in that situation. You know what his will is. Your, his will is for you to pick up the child and rescue it. We're sitting around asking God what his will is. We know what his will is. The question is not if you're called to this mission. The question is only where and how you are called. The call to be involved in this mission was a call that Jesus gave when he called you to be his disciple. Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. If anyone wants to follow me, let him come after me to where I am. There where he will be also. That's the call you're looking for. So quit staring into your Cheerios and quit waiting on some warm, fuzzy feeling for God to tell you what he's already told you in the Bible. You don't need a special voice. You got a verse. So the question is not, listen, the question is not if I'm called to this mission, the question is only where and how. 
And God will direct some of you to do what he's done to direct me. I am a pastor in the United States. Some of you he will direct to be doctors and lawyers and you will do your practice right here. So I'm not trying to diminish you, but I'm saying whatever you do, you are called by God to do it well for the glory of God. And you are called by Jesus to do it somewhere strategic for the mission of God, because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And you have to see the world through the lens of that love. He hit a, yeah, I'm not good. He hit on some points that I that I really wanted to make, and we we have the scriptures. We know what our God's will is in many senses for us. The only difference is where and how. We're all called to go. We're all called to be fishers of people. We're all called to make disciples of all nations. But how and where are the two questions for us to answer? And I think we get some of that by our pursuing a relationship, a friendship with God because then he'll tell us he told Abraham go to a land I'll show you he told Philip go to that road so what's he gonna what's he telling you and me where do we go what do we do I was talking to Jacoby left I think I was talking to him earlier about the he's in the banking business and he's just kind of praying right now well he has to drive to Munster every day and you know and he's praying about, well, maybe my mission isn't there because I live here, everything I have to maybe my mission is here. So that's something he's talking to God about, to his friend. And if we're open to hearing, and if we're really open to doing and going, then as we go, he'll speak to us. He will speak to us. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus said. Does anybody have any comments they'd like to make or anything? Andrea, want a mic? Okay. Um, there's this analogy that I really love that God gave me a long time ago, and I'm really sorry if you grew up in youth group because I feel like I've said it like 85 million times, but I really like it. Um, it's just learning how to hear from God is not easy to explain and for our kids like that's the number one question like what well, I don't know if I'm hearing him I don't know if I I don't know how to do that and so um, anyway this analogy is about uh, softball and and baseball or whatever and there's like there's a first base coach and there's a third base coach and you're taught to hit the ball and just run and you're not supposed to watch the ball. You're supposed to either run through the base. You're supposed to be listening for your for your coaches and not even know where the ball is at. And fortunately for me, um, when I was in high school, my dad was our first base coach. So I knew his voice. I can hear it. Because when you're doing well or whatever is happening or any sporting event, you know how many people are screaming at you? Like even my – like when I, when I was – my mom would be the one like, that's my baby, like all these things, like <laughs> – and everybody's yelling and trying to tell you what to do, and everybody thinks they know what's best at sporting events, and they're yelling, at you, but you have to hear your coach. You have to listen carefully for your coach. So if you had never known or met your first base coach in baseball, would you know his voice when you were running? And so that's what, that's what we're supposed to be doing, is getting to know our coach and practicing listening for his voice so then it gets to the point where when you hear it, it's like, oh, yeah. That, that's it, because you've done it so much. And so anyway, when I was in high school, <laughs> I, uh, my very first time I ever hit a home run, which there wasn't very many. That's not my very first time. There wasn't very many. But um, I'm, not that, my, I'm not that big of a girl in that. Anyway, so when I, when I hit it and every, every base I went around, I, I didn't see the ball. It just kept yelling, go, 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 go. And I was like, there's no way I hit it that far. There's just absolutely no way. And when I went around third, no, go home. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, well, I'm doing this because you're telling me to, but I don't think there's no way. That's impossible. And then when I made it, I was like, I can't believe that just happened. But that never would have happened if I watched the ball or believed myself thinking like, oh, there's no way I'm going to stop because there's absolutely no way I hit the ball that far. And I feel like that's with Abraham as well. It's like, I'm sure there were times where, like, there's no way. I can't, I'm not having this child. How can this be? There's absolutely no way. And then on the other side of it, there are lots of times that I listen to my, 
my first base coach, and it didn't turn out the way I thought. Like, I got out a second. And then you start questioning, like, well, should I have, should I have went? But I, but it's the three things that you had. It's the, I, I heard God, I believed God, and then I did it. And so with Luciana, I'm sure, obviously, that is super difficult, and you start to question and have regret, like, well, should I have, should I have, should I have? But well, the one thing about when I was in softball, I was just like, nope. I, I did what I felt like I was supposed to do. I listened to my first base coach, and yeah, I got out. But you know what? I, I went for it, and I thought I did what I felt like God said. And that's the same thing that we have to do in our hard times. It's like, nope, I was listening, I heard him, and I did. And sometimes it works out, you get the home run, and sometimes you get out, but it's, it's the faith thing. It's, it's God cares.